All right. So tonight we're going to continue discussing um, direct teaching instruction or DTI or DTT. And we're going to delve a little bit deeper into um, exactly what we need for our learners to be able to be ready to take advantage of using DTT. And then also um, exactly how to implement DTT techniques. All right, so I'm going to model that for you. Um, I know that some of you weren't able to access the videos yet, um, but online underneath the, um, I think it's page 10 if you've got um, them in groups of six, but it's on the slide that says what is DTI slash DTT. There's four um, videos there that give you examples of um, people running um, direct instruction techniques. Um, so you should watch those if you haven't already. Okay. All right. So I'm going to start off by kind of going just briefly over what we did last week. So we've got DTI um, or DTT, direct teaching instruction, the teaching method used to teach a new skill using multiple or back-to-back -back trials, also called mass trials. Good. Um, one thing that I did want to note after I took a closer peek at the slides, um, and we'll go over this in more detail when I pass out all of the data sheets for you to see, um, there is a difference between mass trial and random rotation, okay? And we're going to uh, make a SAF med card for that because it is important. Um, but I just wanted to note that while we're reviewing things. And then trial by trial, what does it mean to do something trial by trial? Uh, basically you do like a synopsis of each, like you could do one, two, one, two three, right? So then you do trial by trial, like you do one trial, two trial, three trial, and if they master it, then you go back to, if they master it, you go on to the next. Yeah, that's, that's definitely <laughs> part of it. Um, but trial by trial, it's, it separates itself apart by doing something like another data collection procedure we went over last session was probe data, right? Mm -hmm. So that even though you might teach something 10 times in a row, we're only taking data on it that first time. Okay? That's the prompting, right? That's the probe data. The probe, probe. Yep, okay. yep. And then trial by trial, every single time we do a trial, we're taking data on it. Right? So that's really what differentiates the two. <clears throat> All right, so for you, for those of you who were able to watch the videos already, um, what did you see? Tell me about them. What did it look like? Um, I know, like, with the, I'm trying to think, I mushed them all together in my head. So, like, if you want, like, the last one, for example, he basically was like, okay, so he put three cards in front of him, point to the car was one of them and then he would the kid would point to the car and then he would reinforce them differently each time depending on the kind the, the time the kind of man that he would be giving him like okay give me or point to or in that sense of speaking like he and then like he, they would switch up the cards every so often or he'd give them new cards or and then like i know at one point they were creating two different piles i know he was doing like um I can't, like vocabulary words, I would call mm -hmm. them, I guess, with him, or sight words. Good. And so vocabulary words, sight words. What other things were they working on? We'll get more into like the teaching procedures and okay. stuff in a bit. But what kind of other stuff did you see um, them working on? Vocabulary words, sight words. Tacting. Good. Tacting, manding. Okay. Um, what's the difference between a tact and a mand? Requesting? Requesting, thank you. Yep, yep, nope, good. All right, so 
when we use teaching procedures, we use teaching procedures, we use DTI, um, you can use incidental teaching, but all of those are to work on specific skills. And like you said, some of those are manding, tacting, intraverbals. Um, intraverbals are when you're building a conversation. So for example, it might be greeting another person and you're working on that intraverbal of, hi, how are you? Somebody responds, I'm good. And that person goes, awesome, today I did. So there's a volley that goes back and forth, okay? Intraverbals could also be something like a fill in the blank. Like the cow jumped over the moon or old McDonald's, like in singing those songs, filling pieces in, okay? Um, manding is um, when you're requesting items. Manding is one of the most useful teaching procedures um, to be able to initially teach language. Can anyone guess why? Because it reinforces itself, right? Um, you get the thing you're asking for, therefore it's its own reinforcer. Exactly! Manning is hugely valuable because a kid learns if they ask for a cookie, they get a cookie. Or open, and then whatever they want open, they get access to either what's behind the door or what's in the jar or in the cabinet, right? Good. Eat, drink, those are all really basic ones. Um, usually you start with, um, you know, requesting specific things and then generalize out. Um, I'm going to write mand and tact up on our board. So these are all going to be, um, they're different um, programs, I guess you would call them. Um, but they're very specific. So when we set up a program book, like I showed you the other night, that you would have here, if this was a specific individual, certain student, okay, you would open up this book and then there would probably be tabs in here. You might do the programs that, that are in here or you might have manding. And then there's two or three different programs in here for manding. Tacting, there's a few different programs in here for tacting. Intraverbals, right? Expressive language, receptive. Or you could have the program, something like shapes. And then within this program, you open it up, and then in here, the first one might, might be identifying shapes. That would be tacting. Okay, you're creating a label for it, an ID that's a tact. And then within that, though, you need to work on expressive and receptive identification. So that's another one that I'll put up here. Um, so you're going to see all of those within your program book. We go through those in specific detail. So we've got manding. What did we say manding was? <coughs> Perfect. Manding. That'll be on one side of your card. On the back side, it'll be um, requesting of an item. Okay, we also said tact, tacting, what was tacting? Yeah, labeling an item. The process of understanding that each item has its own name, okay? Or what did we also call that a long time ago? You learned that Oh, I heard a whisper. Sounded sounded good. Stimulus discrimination, right? Demand. Hmm? For tacting. So I know that if I have this marker and this one, and you say, all right, which is the orange marker? I say orange marker. Or you ask me, touch the orange marker, and I do this. Okay? I just identified which one is orange. And I discriminated between two based on um, certain attributes, the color. But all of the other attributes to it are the same. Okay? Um, but tapping is not included in requesting. 
They're completely different. This is requesting and this is just identifying. Okay. So we've got manding and tacting. And then other programs that you're going to see within Wait, so the book. The yep. definition of tacting is SD. Um Tacting is the process of using stimulus discrimination, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're identifying certain things. Okay. I would say tacting is more of um, labeling or identifying a mm -hmm. stimulus. Okay, and then we've got expressive. guess what expressive is but sometimes it's a little bit more complicated than we think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sorry I'm just thinking because I did expressive I like from my first from September to December I worked with one member of an autistic student and this is a lot of the stuff that we did and I remember taking that out and expressive and receptive and trying to like recall what I did with him and I was identifying and stuff and, like, Good. Okay. So expressive is when we express that we have knowledge about something, okay? That we're able to show you in some way. So what was, how do you word that? First person? What did I just say? Especially if you have knowledge about something. There you go. And I'm going to give you examples of these in a moment, but let's finish with receptive. Anybody know what receptive is? Understanding the concept of what someone says to you. Like with my student, I know I had him like identifying ordinary objects that we always use every day, so like a brush or a toothbrush or something like that. And then, like, okay, let's point to the toothbrush. What is this? Like, either he'd express it to me, this is what it is. That's why I was like, I don't know. Good, so I don't know. So, receptive is um, being able to understand a direction or speech and being able to show comprehension and knowledge of a topic or stimuli. Comprehend what? Comprehend able to understand a direction okay. and show comprehension the knowledge of the stimuli. Mm -hmm. Let's see if they give them. I believe that there are. For definitions and PowerPoints, but they didn't have so that's okay. All right, so everybody's got their definitions down? Okay, awesome. So now I'm going to demonstrate for you. So 
some of these different um, teaching techniques, okay, from the different angles here, let's see. So this is what you would call a manding program, okay? I'm just going to hold this up to the screen for a second. Um, so manding is the process of requesting an item. We're literally going to teach our kiddos to use their language or use a sign or a gesture to request items, okay? I'll read this program to you. So this is... Um, They've got, remember the important parts of reading our program sheet is you've got the procedure, the materials, the prompt level, this is full physical guidance. Um, and then it'll show you, give you the directions, okay? And then the mastery criteria. And then this is our set list that we would have down here. So our directions are therapist puts out five to 10 reinforcing items in front of the child. Therapist waits for a child to reach for a desired item. Before a child acquires item, therapist takes item, holds it out of their reach. Therapist pauses and waits for child to request the item. If child signs or verbally requests the item, reinforce by giving the child the item. If the child does not, give verbal model of the items, label, and physically guide child to do the associated sign. Then reinforce by giving item. Tokens only to be given for independent responses, verbal praise to be given for following through with physical guidance. Okay. So our data sheet here is going to be a little bit different than your mass trial or randomized trial data sheet. It's, it's So you write all of the items that you're putting out on the table to the right. You literally just list them one after the other in a column format, okay? And then you have pluses and minuses. What did our pluses and minuses mean, guys? Yeah, incorrect or correct, okay? And there's two separate categories in here with pluses and minuses on them. Pluses and minuses are for independent or prompted verbal response or independent prompted sign use, okay? So I'm going to tally on here exactly how many times this kiddo had an independent verbal response or if I needed to prompt them and then they had a verbal response. Or is this kiddo not quite there at using expressive speech yet, but he's signing and that's really our goal for him. So, okay, maybe he did some independent signing or maybe he needed help to create those signs, all right? So we're tracking all of these as we go across. Um, so I'm going to give you an example of this. I'm going to write a few items on the board. I'm gonna have somebody help me and we put up there. So this is a larger version of this data collection sheet, okay? So I've got over here, date slash items. This could also be trial or items, okay? And then I've got two main columns and then within here, two smaller ones. I've got independent, remember an I, verbal response, 
or a prompted. So we do plus P, right? Verbal response. And then over here, independent sign. And then over here, plus physical prompting for a sign. Okay. I'm just going to go across like that. Um, so what do we want to learn to talk about today, guys? Let's see. Keys. Can I borrow your keys? Mm -hmm. Keys. I love my cell phone. Cell phone is good. Soda. I'm only going to do four items. And baseball. I'm just going to make a really bad joke about a baseball. <laughs> Can you see my baseball? Okay. So, I'm going to say the date, 720. And then list out my items. Ball. Um, drink. Phone. And I don't know what the sign is for keys. That's okay. I do. Do you? Sweet. We got it. Key. Okay, so obviously that's kind of a prerequisite. If you're going to be working with an individual who doesn't have um, the ability for expressive speech, then you're going to have to learn these signs beforehand, right? So a good program book would probably have examples of those signs in there, or, you know, a teacher would go over them with you before you implement the program. All right, so we've got all of these here, ball, drink, phone, key. Um, so again, the most important part is that we've got items that they want, right? Because they have got to make a request for it. If they don't want the item, then manding isn't going to work. How are you going to make somebody ask for something that they don't really care about? So you have to have out items that the student is going to want. Um, Usually you do like a little bit of a preference assessment. Do you mind if I just scooch this so I can try and get this in the view, your um, folder? Thanks, hon. I'm going to just push this back. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I've got these items out. I really want them. All right. Um... Actually, let me do this backwards. I'm going to have you reach for an item, okay. okay? And then when you go to reach for the item, I'm going to withhold it. I'm going to wait a second or two until you make a request. If you don't make a request, then I'm going to do an error correction procedure. What was the error correction procedure on our sheet? Remember, that should be on all good sheets. It says, if child does not... If child signs or verbally requests with a tact, reinforced by giving child item. If the child does not, give verbal model of the item's label and physically guide the child to do the associated sign, then reinforced by giving item. Okay? All right. So, go ahead and reach for... Oops, this is kind of out of the view. All right, you ready? Okay, go for it. Good phone, awesome job, right? And that was an independent response, so I'd give her a token. Awesome. So on my data sheet, I'd go over here and I would go to the phone and I'd look over and she had an independent verbal response and a sign. What's up? <laughs> now, does anybody remember what the key said on the top of the data sheet? What do I use? Plus. Good. Plus. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to say, um, what was it, Paul? Mm -hmm. Plus and plus. Awesome job. Okay. So now I want you to ask for something different. Um, we'll go to reach for something different, but this time... You know, okay. just pause a little extra long, and I'll go through that error correction procedure, okay? Okay. Okay. Ball! Ball! Good ball. 
So I literally remodel for her exactly what she should be doing to get the ball. I help her make the sign, and as soon as she makes the sign, I give her the item. Okay, but I'm not going to give her a token because it wasn't an independent response. But she can still play with the item because she did it, right? It's part of the teaching procedure. All right, good. <coughs> so if I was to code that, I'd come up here. And she needed a, a prompting to be able to do the verbal response, but she didn't do it. So I'm going to say a minus. And needed prompting to be able to do the sign. I'm going to give her a plus because she did let me do that over there. Pete, your own phone your own phone oh, oops. Thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs> sure, Mike. So, what was it? The the yeah, you can turn the lights over here. I just didn't want to turn it on because it gets hot. Uh, what time is it? I don't know. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, so that's that's um, yeah. what we would call, it's a combination of using actual direct training instruction or direct trial cool. training and incidental, okay? But it's not real incidental because it's not really in the natural environment. I'm kind of, you know, creating a teachable moment here by putting out a few items, all right? Um, the difference an incidental manding program would, for example, um, say you're playing with the ball, right? And let's just pretend like we're passing it back and forth. It's a ooh, danger. Yeah. <laughs> or just be looking at the ball. How would that safer? You look at the ball. Could be like your student's drawing, or they're playing with Tickle Me Elmo, or they're doing trains, okay? And you walk over and you say, I want to come play with you, and you take the train away from them, or the ball, or Tickle Me Elmo. And you start playing with it, and then they come to grab from you, but when they grab, you hold back, and you look at them, and you wait for them to say, Ball? Ball. Good. Ball. Here you go. And you give it back, all right? So they have to use an appropriate form of language to get access to the item that they want, okay? Um, we use that in association with those planned ignoring techniques, right? So you're going to ignore the incorrect responses that we want to decrease. Some kids maybe come over and just grab stuff out of somebody's arms or will hit somebody to get access to something. But we're going to ignore that. When they hit you, you completely ignore them or maybe when they scream or they cry or they flop to the ground and instead you literally just label exactly what they are supposed to say and then as soon as they do that then you respond to them okay so you're giving attention to the appropriate behavior instead of the incorrect behavior okay. all right so that's a little bit about manding um, before we get into tacting though Thank you for your participation. You were a wonderful student. Okay. Um, one important feature, well, there are a few important features that my student has, though. Okay. Prerequisites that go into using direct training techniques. Okay. Where we're at a seated table. Not incidental when we're out playing. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we use a lot of incidental or play based learning with our younger kiddos because they don't have the ability to be ready to take advantage of direct training because they need to be able to do a few things. Can you guys think of what some of those things are? What was the question? Sitting Yeah. Attending. Good. Um, the ability to sit for a duration of time. Okay, you're not my typical learner. My typical learner would be like falling out of their chair, wiggly, wiggly, looking all around the classroom. Um, so you actually need to teach that to some students, right? You can reinforce sitting for longer and longer periods of time. All right, let's go sit at the table and do a preferred activity. You know, let's play with Legos, but on the table, and then you can go play. You know, that's how you might start with a preschooler. And little by little, you, you build up their ability to sit for a long period of time. Um, good. So sitting. Another one that you touched upon is attending. A kid can sit in a chair all day long, but he could be looking everywhere else, or he could be stimming, you know, rocking back and forth or humming, right? His attention needs to be on me. Okay? His his eye gaze doesn't have to be on me 110% of the time, but it needs to be there. 
um, coupled with that, with the eye gaze, okay, is the ability to do joint attention. Does anyone know what joint attention is? Like the ability to look here and back at me, look at the items on the table, and then look back at me. Exactly, okay? So when we have, you know, our keys here on the table and I'm looking all around, I have to be able to look and then look up at her and then look back down. Or, um, you know, if, if I put out two balls on the table and I tell you to touch red, I have to be able to look at the ball and then give it to you, right? Um, that becomes even more important when we talk about um, manding and making um, appropriate interactions with others, especially when we're doing greetings and we're teaching that because you need to make eye contact. And you know, our kiddos, a lot of them have a hard time doing that. And so it's a teaching process, right? A lot of the time when um, individuals will start to learn to mand, I don't even teach signs, I don't teach verbal expression. The first step in manding is actually requesting using their eye gaze, okay? So I will let a student play with something for a little while, I'll take it away. What do they typically do? They typically like look at the item, right, when you're holding it down here. So I will teach them that they're not going to get this item back until they make eye contact with me and then they can look back down at the item and I'll give it to them. You just taught him to use joint attention, okay? Perfect example of this, I'll give it. And you can, um, there's a teaching technique that you actually transition the item up and behind your head, okay? So they have an eye gaze shift. They can't help but make eye contact with you, even if they don't mean to. Okay, and then over time, you can fade that prompt out. Okay, I'm literally shaping, remember we were talking about shaping, shaping that behavior of making eye contact with me by closer and closer proximity to my eyes, right? So I'll show you a little bit of this process. I'm gonna have you play with, I don't know whose keys these are. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so you're playing with the keys and then I'm going to take them back and I don't want you to make eye contact with me, okay? Keys, good! So you see, all right, she made eye contact with me and then I gave it back. For some students who are really low learners, you might just even accept bringing this up here and then just kind of looking up a little bit and you give it back to them to the point where then all of a sudden they learn the expectation they know to look up okay now a little bit higher all the way up here but either way you can do that does that make sense and then i give it back to them and so then once she understands that process of okay no matter what it is if i want to drink if i want to eat if I want to continue play with something, I have to make eye contact. And then over time, then I can build in either the sign for it or the verbal with the sign or just the verbal. But all along, if you don't have that eye contact, it's almost impossible to teach after the fact, right? Because you can't undo the language piece and you have to honor that. So you always want to teach eye contact first for requesting. All right. Okay. All right, where were we? So I'm gonna erase this. Everybody's good with examples of, of manding and requesting. We got it from grasp, awesome. All right, so tacting, what was tacting again? <coughs> good. Being able to um, identify an item or show that you have comprehension of it, right? Okay. Another important element that goes into DTI that we didn't just touch upon, but kind of goes with the um, joint attention and eye gaze shift, is that your learner has to be able to scan. Okay. 
they have got to be able to sit with a plane in front of them and be able to look from one item to the other so that they can make a discrimination between the items and learn it. It doesn't always have to be flat. Some students you'll see have a slant board that they use um, because visually that works better for them. Or it might work a little bit better motor wise. You know, maybe they have a hard time picking it from the table. Um, but they have got to be able to scan. And then remember we talked about using sometimes positional um, positional prompting to be able to make it more likely that that learner will be successful because some students have a hard time working further away from them. All right, um, so I'm just going to give you an example of tactile. Okay. I'm going to put out two items in front of me. Ready? Okay. You are ready. My learner is awesome. She's got a calm, quiet body. She's sitting in her chair. <laughs> She's making eye contact with me. We're good to go. All right. So, touch green. Awesome. That is touching green. Perfect. So, she tacted it. Right? She, sh she showed me that she understood exactly which one was green. That this had a label. Awesome. Um... Now I'm going to do an error correction procedure. You ready? Touch green. Touch green. That's green. Good. Okay. Awesome. So, tacting. Just the labeling of items. Now, you can do different types of tacting. You can do expressive or receptive. So, Expressive, remember, it's a verbal utterance, okay? I am showing you that I can express and show you my knowledge about a certain item. So, if I was doing colors, color identification, okay? I'm going to hold up an item and I'm going to ask you a question about it and you have to verbally show me your knowledge and your comprehension, okay? So, what color? Orange. Awesome, it is orange. Okay, so she verbally expressed to me the color. Now, I'm going to show you receptive. Receptive, she does not verbally express to me. Instead, she shows me that she's comprehending the information that I'm giving her. You ready? Touch orange. Good, that is orange, nice work. Do you see the difference between expressive and receptive? Yes, cool question. Yep. I don't get the difference between manding and tacting now. now I'm confused. Okay, manding and tacting. Manding is the process of requesting. And then tacting is the process of labeling and identifying. And you know what's confusing okay. you though? Because these two, are used to teach tacting. Okay. Right, because they're two different teaching procedures. Right. Mm -hmm. So manding is, if you reach for something, I take it back, and then you ask me for it, you get it back. Tacting is just, what is this? Identifying. Just, yep, exactly. Okay. Good. Yep. I'm smart. <laughs> but and and manding, you know, it doesn't have to be. It's just the process of requesting. So if you've got a kiddo that comes up to you and asks for a drink, that was a man. If you're like, oh my god, it's too hot in here, can we leave? That's a man. If you said, oh my god, it's hot in here, that's a tact. Okay, because you're talking about it. You're not requesting anything. You're just talking about it. Um, so hold on. Yeah. So if a learner was to to ask you for something, yeah. that's manding. Like, yeah. I, I need a cool drink. Yeah. That's manding. No. Well, it's tacting that's, because he, that's tacting. If they ask me. It depends, right? So if that's his way of asking you because you know him so well and he doesn't have the verbal repertoire to be able to appropriately ask, mm. but if really like his intention is like, 
I need a cool drink, and normally somebody go gets it, goes to get him a drink, and he gets something from it, then that's actually a man, right? Because that's basically his request. Okay. But if legit, like if you said, Whew, I need a cool drink, and you just said it out loud, but you weren't going to follow through with it, you weren't asking it for anyone else, or you weren't like inadvertently trying to tell me that you wanted to take a break and go to the water fountain, mm -hmm. then that would be attacked. Okay. Does that make sense? Because you're not actually going to do anything with it. You're just so saying. can I have a cool drink? So would I? be a man. Mm -hmm. Coming from you. like. Oh, coming from me. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Coming from you, can I have a cool drink? Would be a man. And attacked would just kind of be a thought out loud. Like, I need a cool drink. Like, if yep. you just kind of said it out loud. Mm -hmm. But you don't actually plan to do anything with it. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome. Um, let me do a few other examples of expressive and receptive. Um, Here's a good one. Can I use you again just because you're in the picture? Mm -hmm. All right, so with some of our younger students, you might do something like labeling body parts. Okay. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. always a fun one. Um, so I'm going to do, we'll do touch nose. And go ahead, you got that. <laughs> Sorry, that's just touch nose and touch knee. Okay. okay. So first I'm going to do... Um, Expressive, and then I'm going to do a receptive trial. All right, so expressive, are you ready? Mm -hmm. So expressive would be, what's this? Nose. Good, it is a nose. Okay, so she's expressing, she's showing me that she knows it with expressive language. Now I'm going to say, touch your nose. Good, okay, receptive. She took in what I said, and then she was able to identify exactly what that was to show me her comprehension of what a nose was. All right, did you see the difference? Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Um, other examples of um, expressive and receptive, say if you were teaching jumping, like action movements, those sorts of things, grocery store, okay? If you were people in places, that's a good one because sometimes we do that with a lot of our older guys too, right? So if you were going to do that with expressive, you could hold up a card of a bedroom or a grocery store and say, what is it? And then they verbally out loud say, grocery store or playground, right? Expressive. You take those same things now and then you put them out on the table and you say, touch the one that's a grocery store or touch the one you know, that you go to bed in, and then they show you. They're not expressing it all, okay? They're comprehending, you know, what you're saying, that prompting, and then they're actually identifying that way, okay? All right, awesome. Um, do you guys need to take a two-minute break? I know that we're going to end a little bit early because you're going to watch the videos, but I know it's hot in here, too, and everybody's kind of fading. Do you want to take a break, or do you want to just plow through? <coughs> Plow through? Yeah, let's plow. Okay. Good. It's two minutes, guys. Hmm? Two minutes. Everybody just stand up. Wiggle around. Wiggle around, wiggle, wiggle, and wiggle. wiggle, wiggle. Back down. Oh, you need two minutes to plow? Maybe I do. Like, Wait, I can't breathe down. right now. Right. I'm freaking knocking yeah. on death's door over here. Can you please be expressive? God. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I don't think that's uh, one of her deficits there. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, guys. So in the slides, you can take a peek more about, um, it'll go into depth. It says, you know, the basic con concept of DTT, and then it'll go literally into the different steps of setting up a discrete trial. Okay. Um, you've got the antecedent, the prompt, the response, the consequence, um, and then the consequence for correct and incorrect response. Um, what's an example of an antecedent? Something that happened before the behavior. Good. So in my 
sample here, when I put out the two markers, the orange and the green, what was my antecedent here? I can't remember what color it was. Dusty. Getting the markers. Hmm? Yeah. Well, what was, what was my... Uh... The prompt? Yep. Touch orange. Good. All right. So, touch orange. Awesome job! That's orange. So, what was the response there? He touched the, he touched the marker. Good, and it was independent, right? Independent response. It wasn't partial physical. I didn't have to model anything for her. Awesome. So then the consequence for that correct response was? Good job. Verbal praise. Yeah, yeah. awesome. Um, and then I didn't have to do an incorrect procedure there. But if we did, let's try it again. You ready? Touch orange. Touch orange. That's orange. Nice work. Okay, so the error correction procedure, you re-give the prompt, and then you guide them to make the correct choice. Right? Awesome. Um, general teaching guidelines after delivering the initial instruction, never allow more than three to five seconds to pass without a response. So as we saw, I gave her a second or two, and then if she didn't choose the correct one or she was going towards the incorrect one, I didn't let her make an error. Okay, I immediately guided her to the correct response first. I didn't meet. I first reprompted and then guided her to the correct response. Um, if an incorrect response occurs, do not say no or negatively react. Right, follow the error correction procedure prescribed. Why is that important? That we don't say nope, that's the wrong one. This is the orange. No could be a trigger word. It could be sure. It does, absolutely, because they're going to find alternate ways to get the correct one. Too Way too much verbiage. That's the first thing that comes to my mind, okay? A lot of the individuals that we're working with have communication issues. And especially if we're trying to teach them the correct language or the tact for this, I don't want them to think that anything that I'm, it's not no, it's green. Okay, so keep it simple. You ignore the incorrect response and literally just remodel the correct verbal. That way, that's all that they hear and they're much more likely to learn it in a, fa in a faster manner. Um, and it's important for you to do that error correction procedure because there are individuals where if you put out the green and the orange marker, okay, and we were to do something and I said, touch the orange and you went for the green. Go ahead. Orange, that's the orange marker. I want you to do it again. Okay, touch orange. Orange, that's the orange marker. Do you see what she's doing though? I'm not reprompting or being able to be fast enough to get there before she touches the correct one. Chances are, when I teach a student with lower disability this skill, they're gonna think when I have to touch the orange marker, the process is I touch green and then I touch orange. Mm -hmm. And then you're gonna sit back and start banging your head and being like, why it, does she keep doing this? Yeah. Because that's how I'm teaching him, okay? I'm teaching him that's what he's supposed to do. You touch the green and then the orange. Whereas if, go ahead, touch the orange marker. Touch the orange marker. That's the orange marker. So that immediately after I give the prompt or that SD, she's touching the correct one. Okay, so she's making that contingency, that link between what I said and the stimulus that I want her to identify. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. It's the same thing with language, and that's why we have to be really careful when we prompt, when we use our language, um, especially when we do things like uh, say ball, ball, all of a sudden you hear kids walking around, say ball, <laughs> to get the ball, and it's like, no, instead, don't say, say ball, just say ball, keep it clear and simple, so that way that's what they know, ball, mm -hmm. right, good, um, and then that brought in a good point, because you were talking earlier about some of the videos online, right, and he was constantly using the child's name, Mm. When he was asking before, he said, touch, you know, 
you know, they dumped it and touch, and it was constant. And then, so it became part of the, the uh, you know, the estate you know, dump it and touch. You know. Right. And then you have kids that all of a sudden, like, don't respond to their name. <laughs> you can say Duncan all day long, but Duncan's been linked with so many other things that he just thinks it's a part of, like, the learning process. Or they talk about themselves as their person. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Duncan yes. went to the park today. Exactly. <laughs> it's a riot. Mm -hmm. So when you teach, use the least amount of verbiage as possible. And you especially don't want to use their names. Um, I really try to tell people that if you go to use an individual's name, make sure you only use it at times where you know you can get their attention afterwards if they don't respond to you. Absolutely, because if you sit there and you call somebody's name over and over and over again and you're not following through with that procedure where you know, you're getting their attention and then they get what they want, then you're actually building them to completely ignore you, okay? You're teaching them that they can ignore you calling their name. So I would only ever, you know, really try to do it in times where you know you can follow through with an error correction procedure. You can get their attention sometimes doing what we did with the eye gaze shift, you know? They have something that you like, you call their name, and then you take whatever it is. Oh, hi, here you go. You know, and that's how you kind of teach that that responding to name program, initially, anyways. And then you fade up. Okay, good. Okay, so I'm going to um, we're gonna go over some teaching guidelines and then we will probably call it a night because I wanted for you guys to start taking data but I want to be able to work through mass trial data versus random rotation and then all of us to do a group activity related to that and so that'll take a little bit of time so we'll get through what we're we're gonna do for teaching guidelines <clears throat> and um, talk about those videos a little bit that either you saw or you're going to see. And then we'll do SAF meds and we'll call it a game. Deal? <clears throat> okay. Um, all right, so within your, your PowerPoint, it says here, mix table work with non-table work. What page? Um, mine Seven. might be different from yours. Um, so more teaching guidelines, it comes right before um, yes. trials for requesting and receptive skills. Okay. So mix table work with non-table work. And then intersperse difficult tasks with easy tasks. Change activities every 15 to 30 minutes and vary types of responses. All right, so the first three there, mixing mixing up work at the table. Why is that important or interspersing difficult tasks with easy tasks? Is this a <coughs> Who's ready first? Who's going? I'm just going to say if it's too difficult after a while, they're just not going to want to do it because it's whether... Like they might not understand it or they might just be getting really frustrated with it. So usually when students get frustrated, they shut down. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's actually a uh, SAF med term. I'm not going to make you guys remember it. Um, but we use it for our BCBA exam. Um, it's called the uh, PREMAC principle. And it's when you purposefully put an easy task before a hard task to build up behavioral momentum. So you give them something really easy and they kind of start feeling good about themselves and they feel confident and then when they hit the hard task, it's not like douche hitting a wall. It's like, yes, I got this, okay? Because you started that ball rolling. Um, so we use that a lot. And then obviously you go back and forth too because you don't want to sit there and just drill them, all right, let's go back to something easy and then it keeps that behavioral momentum going. Um, also, you want to switch up, as you saw in the video that he was he was working with the boy, he had multiple programs out on the table at once. 
and ready to go. I think he even had stuff like on the floor too. Um, he was very prepared and that's really what a good ABA direct instruction center would look like is that you've got some bins already set up or some extra materials, okay? And then you're running through the program and you just keep switching it up. So I might say, you know, I might go over to a learner. And I have a few things with me. And then I do what's called interspersing trial. So I'm gonna go back and forth between different programs, okay? And say, touch your nose. Good job, that's touching your nose. Touch the green one. Awesome, that one is green. What is it? Baseball. Awesome, clap your hands. Nice job clapping your hands, okay? So you see I'm building in different programs there. I'm doing expressive, I'm doing receptive, I'm doing, um, you know, obviously those were all tacting, none of them were Mandy because she wasn't making any requests. But I'm interspersing the trials and I'm keeping it fresh. And then probably, I'm also interspersing trials in a way that, you know, not that it's just easy, but that she um, knows some of the things. And then some of them are brand new. Those brand new ones would be hard, right? And those old hat, maybe maintenance trials or things that she knows easy, like touch your nose, clap your hands, just gives that extra opportunity for reinforcement. Again, just to keep up the behavioral momentum so that if she is struggling with those really hard ones, you know, she's still more likely to, to stay with me. All right, great. Um, let's see. Varying types of responses required for tasks. So avoid presenting all the, the same kind of task at once. Repetition is important. Present as many trials as possible throughout the session for each um, skill. So you're going to try and get in as many, like we talked about, that multiple trial format, trial by trial or mass trial, random rotation, whatever it is that you're using, but giving the learner as many opportunities in that compact amount of time to work on that skill because as we talked about, you've got that long synapse, right? And that's what we're working on. We're trying to make it bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where it's open and my learner has maintained and or has acquired, mastered, and then will maintain that new task. All right, and then there's one other piece that was really important that goes into our um, training technique guidelines. What else? Comes kind of at the end, but something that you want to plan for from the beginning. Reinforcement, I mean, that's always, yep, that's always important. It goes kind of hand in hand with teaching loosely. Does anyone remember what it means to teach loosely? Teaching loosely is when you plan from the beginning for generalization, right? So when I put the markers over here and I say, and I'm working on her receptively identifying the green one, I might put these over and I say, um, touch the green one. Good, that's the green one. I'm gonna do random rotation, so I'm moving the items. Now I say, which one's green? Good, okay, so I switched it. My SD was similar, and then I'm asking her to identify the object, but I'm changing my terminology a little bit, okay? So that's teaching loosely. Or you might also put these items out in front of her and you might say, hey, give me the green one. So now she's not just touching it, but she's actually having to pick it up and give it to me. Um, other things that go into teaching loosely, remember we talked about um, using various items that all fit within the same category. Um, but they vary just slightly, right? So maybe I would have a variety of different green markers. Um, this one and, you know, a regular Sharpie, maybe a, a pen, whatever. Or if I was really just working on color and this wasn't a student who needed the initial steps of teaching process where we just had all of the same colors and all of the same items, we're looking for real mastery, I'd have a whole ton of a variety of different items that were all green okay and I would put them out on the table and then I would ask them you know um, amongst other colors too 
and then I would say, you know, touch, touch the green one or whatever. Does that make sense? So we're teaching loosely from the beginning, and that builds generalization. Okay, the ability for our kiddos to really like pick up that that um, piece of knowledge and be able to apply it anywhere because we didn't teach it in one specific way. All right, questions, guys? We went over a lot. I think that'll be a good spot to pick up from Monday. Um, all right, staff meds. Monday's at six, right? Six, yeah, six. Six, six. six. right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay.